Okay, we're back. The three o'clock block. Likeable science, one of the most likable shows in our lineup. <laughs> That's uh, Ethan Allen, and he is the host guest. Or was it the guest host? <laughs> and I am whatever the other, the other version of that is. The guest, guest host. host. Right. Okay, he's the real host of the show. And uh, we talk about things uh, from science and technology uh, that we stumble across uh, in our daily readings. And this is one of the most interesting things that has come by in a while. Very high tech. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is a, derived from an article in the Daily Kos, K-O-S. Very interesting newsletter on the internet. You can subscribe to it. It's got a lot of interesting articles, a lot of them about politicians. But this one was at the tail end of, was it yesterday morning's daily costs? And, and I, I said, what? What is this? Because it, it, the title of the article was The Domestication of Fire. What has that got to do with Trump? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so I click on that, and there's this fabulous article. And I, I sent it to Ethan because I wanted to compare notes with on it. So you read the article. What did you um, think, Ethan? It, it was great. It was, it was a real nice demonstration of how fire was, in some sense, probably the first big disruptive technology. And it, it changed humanity. It, it, it changed everything about how humanity lived. It allowed us to expand our range from the tropics and subtropics up into the temperate zone, even in the Arctic. It allowed us to get more food, more energy. Uh, probably altered, evolutionarily altered our heads, quite possibly allowing our brains to grow further, uh, freed up time, maybe the basis for language allowed us to start altering the landscape, that was probably some of the earliest climate change that we were actually inducing there. So uh, yeah, it's, it, it's sort of uncountable, it, its impact. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But let's unpack that. You just you said a mouthful <clears throat> just now. There's a lot of stuff there. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just uh, thinking at random about some of the things that fire did for us. Um, I guess the one that comes to mind at first is it, it's a defensive mechanism. It defends against uh, the beasts of the, of the wild because they don't like fire, and you right. can chase them away with fire and survive their attack. This is very important. Right. Another one would be, uh, and some of these deserve more conversation, others less. Another, another one would be um, uh, keeping warm. Right. You know, they didn't have shelters. They had caves, which were dark. And cold. Uh, and cold. <laughs> and the fire could, you know, help them survive in, in, in bad weather. In, indeed. Other than the very shallow entrance to a cave, you can't really go very far into a cave without fire. Because uh, you like, your cave is dark. Yeah. <clears throat> Plus, there's... Often other things living in the cave, some of which might be fairly large and nasty and might not like you being there or might decide that you will be a good meal. But with fire, again, you, you can drive them out, take over their space. And then, yes, you have shelter. You know. uh, While we're talking about caves, <clears throat> you see all these uh, drawings on the caves. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I actually saw drawings on a cave it was, in, it was in a place called Lazy Z in, in southwest France. Mm -hmm. uh, quite remarkable. But the cave was dark. Right. How could you possibly draw anything intelligible on the wall of a cave unless you had light? Right. There go fire. Right. You know. So indeed, fire is probably in some sense responsible for human artistic creativity too. On that yeah. Sense, you know? yeah. Yeah. I mean, the idea of putting pen to paper, so to speak, actually creating a graphic that depended on light. on light. Right. In a cave with a with a surface that you could actually draw on. Um, so that was that was pretty right. interesting, and if you could if you could draw something on the cave, you could have conceptual thoughts, and you could start developing language right. by drawing on the you cave. Record your thoughts too, and, and it's a different medium other than simply verbalizing things. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a fixed medium, a long-lasting medium, yeah. other than the transient nature of speech. So yeah, again, very, very powerful influence because you can't you can't do any of that without without fire, basically. And just, just to, just to uh, put a time frame on this, this is probably around eight, 80,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, which doesn't seem like it's that, that much. You know? um, and it probably happened before uh, humankind 
uh, left uh, the East Rift Valley in, in East Africa. Yeah, I think this article suggests that somewhere probably around 400,000 years ago, we actually probably gained mastery of fire. In 100,000? Yeah, yeah, it was quite a long while ago. There's, there's some evidence we were using fire perhaps a million, a million and a half years ago, the, the early, early hominids at least used it, but they may not have known how to control it, to, to start right. fires and right. keep, them, keep them going. Things know. moved slowly in those days. Yes. I mean, in order to figure out how to make a hearth, probably took them a hundred thousand. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Whereas, you know, the iPhone came in five years. Everyone has one. Right. Yeah. This is. Yeah. Things were moving much more slowly then. And I get the biggest. The biggest challenge of all was that how do you keep it burning? How do you keep the fire burning? You got to get the fuel. Um, you got to keep on su supplying it, um, and um, you have to have a way to have, have, have it in a place to have it burn without getting doused in the rain or swept in the wind. Right, or without, without starting and getting out of control, right? And yeah, or start. letting it create a forest fire right, and, right. And, and burn, burn you out around right. you. Right. And hurt you. Right. So, um, you know, these, these two, they, you're right, they took a long time right. to figure it out. I'm sure there are lots of false starts. So how do you think, and this is a question that's not really answered in the article, how do you think that, that humankind ever really found fire? I mean, where they could control it, where they could, it, at all. Yeah. Uh, where did it come from? Yeah, one, one, one can only speculate that early uh, peoples saw fires that were naturally occurring, saw animals fleeing from them, perhaps wandering through their aftermath, found some roasted plants and roasted animals, and being hungry, ate those and realized they were like good and tasty and gave faster energy to them. So, uh, you know, it made that connection between the fire they, somebody had to make the connection. Right. That fire was um, had, had had beneficial effects. Right. Right. Um, but but once having made that connection, they had to actually get it. Right. You put yourself out on the on the plains there. How did you? How right. could you get fire? It's not so easy. Right. And once you've got it, if you don't if you don't understand how to make it, then you then keeping it going is this sort of incredibly valuable thing to keep it always going. Keep a, a stash of hot coals you can start a new fire with, right? Yeah. Becomes this almost sacred duty, uh, you know, because the life or death matter. Right. Perhaps. Well, you know. certainly. But it strikes me also that this is some one person, whether he be Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon man, one person figured it out, um, and he had very little schooling, by the way. <laughs> One person figured it out, and he was able to do it. But I think the remarkable thing is, I don't think we know for sure, but this was happening in various places. Right. Um, now, it could be that it, they discovered it in the East Rift uh, Valley, uh, and then as, as uh, you know, the diaspora took place, they took, they took with them one thought, and that thought is, we better know about fire, because fire will, will save us. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm guessing that it got independently discovered a number of times and probably got lost. You know, there were probably groups that discovered it and then lost fire and died out and, yeah. oops, you know, they didn't make it, you know. But somebody else would discover how to do it, how to use it, how to control it a little better maybe the next time. Right. You know? So lightning sounds like a good prospect, don't you think? I mean, if, if there was a lightning bolt and something was burning because of the lightning, uh, then they would see that it was happening and they would try to take a piece of burning material, burning wood, whatever, and and reduce it to their own control and try to keep it alive. Yeah, once, once you began to understand what fire could do for you, right, and understood the basic process of adding more wood to it to keep it going, then, yeah, then you, you started the process of, of sort of domestication of fire, and uh, presumably groups found that very valuable to do. Yeah. And now there was this movie, you know, when I was looking at this issue in preparation for today's uh, show, I was trying to remember about the movie, and it was a movie with Ray Don Chang, uh, who in those days was really a knockout, um, and, uh, and a few other guys, and they all wore these fat... They, in fact, they got some kind of Academy Award for makeup, because everybody <laughs> looked like Neanderthal. You know? <laughs> and, and, and somebody invented a language, a caveman mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. and they spoke the language in this mm -hmm. movie. The name of the movie, ultimately, I remembered, was Quest for Fire, right. 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a movie without any English in it, mm -hmm. without any civilization whatsoever, with these 
fabulous scenes, scenery stretching across, you know, 50 miles at a time um, with, with the, this small tribe, maybe a dozen people of, uh, who were fascinated with fire, who knew how important it was. And they were involved in a, in a, a kind of fisticuffs with another tribe down the block. Um, mm -hmm. And in the process, they, they lost their fire. So uh, they, were, they were freezing on a little island in a, in a kind of swamp. Um, they were hungry and cold. Uh, they were going to die. And they sent out a, a search party to, uh, to search for fire. And that's why the movie's called Quest for right. Fire. Right. And it teaches you what you would have to do in those right. days. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's set 80,000 years. Right. So they knew about fire earlier. Right. But now this was, um, you know, uh, a quest right. to regain the power that they had had with their fire. Right, yeah. And, and you know, obviously, if you were someone in that culture who understood fire and, and knew how to keep it going, knew how to revitalize it from embers and all, you'd be in a position of real power. You, you might be sort of a, almost a shaman or a, a leader of some sort, right? Yeah. Well, it was a, it was a mysterious thing. Right. I mean, imagine sitting around a campfire when we were kids and looking into the flames. It was hypnotic. Yes. Uh, some people right. inappropriately so, the pyro, pyromaniacs. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. but, but um, you know, looking at it and seeing the hypnotic effect of it, you think maybe this is a, a, an eternal being this is a god. This is mm -hmm. a spiritual uh, a person that is way beyond, you know, your experience. And you, thus you attach a religious significance to the fire. Right. I mean, other, other than not being sort of cellular in nature, fire is very much has many of the characteristics of life, actually. You know? um, yeah. But, well, yeah, and, and it's, you know, staring the fire has inspired poets and scientists alike. Uh, uh, the famous chemist Kekulé is said to have discovered the ring-like structure of benzene. Uh, while staring into fire and watching the fire tongues loop around each other and then realizing that that's how, that's how the carbon atoms in benzene had to be structured to make it, give it the properties it had. Uh, what nobody had figured out for us, great, a great puzzle in chemistry, as to how benzene could possibly have its weird properties. Well, it's, it's truly uh, one of the critical parts of our universe. You know, what, what did they say in the old times? What was it? Oh, this is slightly religious, but... Uh, there are only four things in the world. There's fire, wind, water, and earth. Mm -hmm. That's it. But you can see the, you know, the, um, the power and the importance of fire in the, in the development of humanity. Oh, right. I, you, you, we, would not, we would not be here. That's what, what we I said. We would not be here. That's what I said. I mean, it was truly disruptive in the sense it just radically altered the course that humanity was, was taking. We were... We were confined to a narrow little band of tropics and subtropics. We spent virtually all of our time running down food, eating food. Had you know, that was sort of the extent of our lives. Uh, once we had fire, you could get a lot more nourishment a lot faster. You protein, could, yes, and protein is very important right. to human development right. uh, on, a, on an evolutionary scale. One of the nice points that article made was it, it uh, allowed scavenging to become effective, right? You can only scavenge a dead animal for a little while before it's rotting, right? And then you can't eat it, or you'll get sick and die. But you can take that same rotting animal and cook that meat, and it's fine. It's, it's a great source of protein still, you know. Those little maggots that are in there are just extra protein, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And there's a suggestion that over time, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, um, fire allowed you uh, to, it's easier to eat. It's easy, if you're going to do meat, right. A uh, fire helps you uh, make the food softer, right. and therefore you don't have to work as hard. Right. And this led to an evolutionary development in, in the in the in the uh, in the skeleton of the head and the and the teeth and, right. and the jaw. You didn't have to have this massive brow ridge to anchor a, uh, anchor a bunch of jaw muscles on anymore. You didn't have to have a huge ridge on the top of your skull to whole lot of heavy jaw muscles. Yeah, it became yeah. much easier because it breaks down not just for me but for starches for uh, grains or anything. Uh, cooking them makes them softer, yeah. makes them more accessible, more digestible. So, been, so, you can eat more, you can eat faster, you can digest it faster. And you're more efficient in general right. in getting yeah. protein into your body. And protein is what makes, protein led to the evolution of the bigger brain, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's like if you go all the way back, go back to that 400,000 
point where mm -hmm. presumably it was discovered in the East Rift Valley, it changed the evolution of the species. Right. Fire was our friend, our partner in evolution. Fire made it possible for us to survive, to eat, to succeed in, in hunting, right. uh, to improve. Um, but it goes further than that. I, I want to talk about uh, the diaspora for a moment. Um, you know, somehow from the East Rift Valley, humanity got to go everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, in different ways, uh, with different evolutionary results, and obviously between the races. Um, and to cross the Siberian Straits, which are very, very cold. They were colder then, now they're a little warmer. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you do that? You, you can't go into a, uh, an Arctic environment and survive right. without a way of staying warm. And fire allowed that. Thus, fire allowed the diaspora. Right, right. It allowed us, yes, to spread out of this, this very narrow band of tropic, subtropics that we were as, as essentially apes we were confined to. Uh, but once we had fire, yes, we could, we could spread north, we could spread south, you know, and many more resources, new food, new food sources, uh, you know, all kinds of opportunities yeah. opened up for well, us. And let's talk about the uh, fire and weapons. You needed a sharp stick. Mm -hmm. You needed um, a piece of rock uh, that was sharp as a weapon. And fire gets you there. Fire applied to the stick could make it Hard sharp it. and pointed. Yeah, Couldn't it. do that otherwise. Right. Um, the same thing with, uh, with rock. If it. you made the rock hot, you could flake off right. the pieces of it and make a, a blade. Uh, I know this is ridiculous in the sense that, you know, here we are, 2019, we're talking about something that happened somewhere between 80,000 and 400,000 years ago, <clears throat> but I think we have to understand this sort of thing. It's good to stop and appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, there was, <clears throat> there was a, a real change that came about, and, and it came about because of one sort of simple thing. It yeah. was fire, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it's, I think it's about time to take a break, uh, Ethan. Why don't we take a break of maybe, what, 10,000 years or so? <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back. We'll talk more about the domestication of fire. Okay. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us we're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show, and it's streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Hey, we're, we're back with Ethan Allen and me talking about the domestication of fire. You know, I, I don't think we can forget for a moment that it's built into us. We didn't get here by some magical process. We are the product of evolution over those 400,000 right. years. Right. Um, and um, fire is part of the evolution. And in our, in our DNA, in our way of looking at things, uh, in our very existence, is built in a kind of relationship with fire. Maybe that's why it's so fascinating to talk about it. Yes, and, and, and it's so fascinating. I mean, to, if, if, you, if you sit around a campfire, it is. There's something very mystical about that experience, almost. And, and there's something, it's a bonding experience. It's... Uh, people just sit there and stare at the fire, and they start talking. And this article makes the point that, that you know, f that kind of situation may have helped lead humanity into the use of language, actually. Yeah, so it's, it creates a social bond to be around the, mm -hmm. the fire. Point. And being around the fire through the darkness of the night uh, offers a kind of cocoon where you can actually exchange ideas. You have to build a language, but you have to exchange ideas and and feelings and whatever motivations, uh, and and thus create a, a bit of a community around the fire. Right. 
uh, expanded the length of day and at the same time because you were using the fire to cook your food, you actually had the energy to stay up and communicate. And yeah, it's a magnet. Really yeah. It's a magnet for everything you right. do really to eat mm -hmm. and cook and sleep warmly and socialize at night around the fire. Right. It, it brings these people together and in so doing it creates a society, a, right. a bond, a community and before you know it now you have a family. It's all around the hearth. Mm -hmm. And you have, we can talk about dogs later, that's mm -hmm. another part. But, but um, and then it goes to language, you know, communication, mm -hmm. and as you said, it goes to religion. Right. All these are, these things are inextricably intertwined in our DNA over 400,000 years. Right, I mean, if you, if you think about it, many, many religions use fire in various now more symbolic ways, shapes, and forms as uh, a rebirth, uh, a, a purifying, a re, re blossoming of humanity, whatever, um, in, in various uh, traditions. The fire plays very critical roles in some of them. Yeah, uh, we've just had a show with Rabbi uh, Krasnijansky of Chabad of Hawaii, and he told me that, uh, well, I mean, he reminded me that um, there are, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, what they call an eternal light in every synagogue which burns all the time. And that, that fire is uh, symbolic. Right. And so I think, that, and it has to be eternal, just the way the fire was, should have been eternal in Quest for Fire, the right. movie. Yeah, I mean, symbolically it's saying that this is critical that we keep fire in our lives and we keep it going. We, we understand the critical nature of, that, of this, this act keep a fire burning. At some fundamental because, level we must understand. Yeah, early that. on getting a fire going was probably a very, very tough thing. I don't know if you've ever tried starting a fire without proper implements. It, well, the article it, talks about it. over a period of time, and it was probably earlier than 80,000, more recent than 80,000 years ago, they invented the, uh, I don't want to say fire drill, but that's what right, it was. Right. It was a fire drill. Right. A little wooden stick that you... Right, with a bow on it that you move back and forth. So it spins and spins and spins into dry wood, and hopefully the friction eventually generates enough heat that you can get a little tinder going. And if there's no, not too much wind and you aren't too klutzy, maybe you can get a, a fire going. But I mean, it's a, unless you're a master of that technique, it's a very difficult and chancy thing to do. Um, but but, but it's, a lot, it's a lot better than, you know, hiking across the... the the the, right. the 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 terrain for miles and days right. to and find trying to take it away from a hostile chance, group find people. somebody else who had fire and <laughs> steal it from him right. <laughs> and you know but every boy scout knows how to do this now <laughs> and you look at a boy scout with a fire drill and you realize that this has been implicit in the uh, in the human condition for how many tens of thousands of years we could not have survived without it well sure no and if, I mean if you go out camping one of the key things you take with you is the stuff make fire, you know, lighter, matches, flint and steel, something that's going to enable you to make fire because, you know, that's, that's part of the whole thing. I mean, and, uh, I mean, Jack London years ago wrote his story uh, to build a fire where this becomes a, literally a life and death matter, whether this guy can build a fire or not. And, uh -huh. uh, and he's stuck in 75 below zero weather and Oops, and spoiler alert, you know, he doesn't make it. <laughs> so somewhere around the turn of the 20th century, I mean the year 1900, um, you know, at the year 1900, we had, we had fire. We had gas lamps mm -hmm. on the streets. Mm -hmm. We had kerosene stoves. Mm -hmm. um, we, we lived in many ways on the same fire, the same flames that the, those guys, uh, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the fields, uh, sure. in, the, in the woods and across the mountains, uh, we're using in 80,000 80, years ago. And we were still doing it. Right. But sometime, uh, right around then, around the turn of the 20th century, we invented electricity. And so let me ask you this. And then we gave up smoking. We gave up smoking. <laughs> so when's the last time you saw an open flame? Last year, last year, probably, other than maybe the random candle. The charcoal or at a barbecue, uh, right. at a barbecue, maybe. Well, <laughs> at a campfire, or a campfire. Fire, you know? But we don't see much of it. Right, no. And, and yet uh, before, they were absolutely central and kept your, kept your home fire burning, right? Uh, home, uh, oh, God. Well, and if you look at our literature, if you look right. at our culture in general, really globally, right. fire is 
all through it in every way. The, the words, uh, the notion of fire, the meaning of fire, the effect of fire. Sure. It's everywhere. And I, we haven't gotten rid of that. And we're going to get in more and more high-tech things. There would be no open flames in the next century. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we will still be thinking about and talking about fire. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, electricity has replaced fire in so many ways. It's the, it's the, you know, fire was the technology. Electricity is the new technology. And beyond that, I don't know what, I don't right. know what happens after that. Right. It will be something else remarkable. And I think what it makes us uh, appreciate is that, we, we, as I said, we would not be here. We would not be anywhere. We'd still be in the East Rift Valley. Right. Had we not had the benefit of this. Yeah. And that means that people were thinking about how to survive. The great human, the great human attribute, thought, and creativity, and innovation. And they figured it out. It took them a long time, but they figured it yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a classic you know, Darwinian selection here. You know, the, the ones that didn't figure out never made it. Right. You know, and the, right. The, the ones who did and knew how to do it and could pass that pass the, that ability on to their offspring. You know, right. The and, brains. And in Quest for Fire, you know, the, the group of people who sent out the party to steal the fire from the next tribe, um, they survived. Um, but, but in other parties, they, uh, other tribes, they didn't think of that. And they lost the fire right. and they died. Yeah. And that was the end of their line. You know? Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure the loss of a fire has killed off Many lines of people over the over the eons, you know. <laughs> you know, I used to think that uh, when worse came to worse, that that I could disappear into the North Woods, and and reinvent those early days. <laughs> that I I would take my Boy Scout uh, fire drill and, mm -hmm. and uh, I would make a little fire and I would survive and it would be critical to survive, um, and I would I would then hunt more effectively with my sharpened stick. I would, I would kill an animal, use his skin uh, for uh, my, my clothing, and um, I, would, I would gather around a group of people who would, who would enjoy a, a kind of common interest and become a little society, and I would somehow survive. And what did you say, Einstein? Einstein's great quote, what was it? Oh, he said about World War III. About the world wars, he said, "I know not what weapons will be used for world, world War III, but I can tell you, World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones." That's where we may be, <laughs> right? And there won't be many of us either. Right. Right. <laughs> we'll be back there, and, 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 and we, won't, we won't be evolutionary. Evolution wise, we won't be as strong as we used to be right. either. Now that that control of fire and the, the ability to create it. I mean, remember the movie Castaway, when Tom Hanks finally, after long struggles, gets he makes his fire. And, and that enables him suddenly, now he can, doesn't have to eat raw crabs and with slimy, gooey stuff in their legs. He can cook the crabs and couldn't cook crabs. And, you know, yeah. So, you know, being reduced to the state of nature is really not a likely possibility anymore, even if you know how to make a fire drill. And so I think what we, what we got is um, we got the new technology, we got electricity, we got nuclear energy, mm -hmm. and we really have to make the most of it because... Um, it, can't go back. I don't no. think we can go back, Ethan. No. If, if we go back, there's only going to be a very small number of people. Right. No, no, no. You, can't, you can't turn back the clock. But we have to appreciate what happened. Right. Because there are lessons uh, in innovation, uh, in, in the development of the human condition. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's worth having this conversation. We're studying technology at its, at its, at its, its earliest stage. Right. And you can think of this as that... Humanity got a hold of, a, of an energy source there with fire, right? And now we're, we're looking around, looking at solar energy, and being, being able to capture that, and wind energy, and wave energy. Yes, and so yes, we're, yes. We're, we're searching for more and better energies, and atomic energy, nuclear energy. Uh, I mean, all these different paths we're now searching for more energy and better ways to get energy instead of just simple combustion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, just like fire, we become dependent on our discovery. We become dependent on the disruptive technology we stumbled into. Right, right. And now we have other disruptive technologies right. that we are dependent on. We can't give them up. Right. And I guess that's a lesson here, too. Mm -hmm. Because if you give up something you become dependent on, whoa, you're in trouble. You know? <laughs> right. So um, the, the comparison I want to make before we close here today, Ethan, is 
the second technology that humankind discovered probably a little after fire was Start your domestication of dogs. Domestication of dogs. Right, that was again a pivotal event that, that shaped our futures and even more radically altered the future of, of the domestic dog. But uh, had again powerful, far-ranging effects on, on both groups uh, yeah. in terms of our food, our ability to get things done, to go places, to, to travel to protect ourselves. All of these things were, were mightily impacted by domesticating dogs. Yeah, and this happened many tens of thousands of years ago. And like fire, um, we became dependent. We developed a dependency with dogs. Maybe that's the magic of the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are our partner in evolution. They have helped us evolve. Without them, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I appreciate dogs on a, an affection basis. Mm -hmm. But truth is that man's evolution, humankind's evolution over the years, has really depended on having dogs. In the East, East Rift Valley and elsewhere in the diaspora, um, and, and right on through maybe, what, the 18th century or so, mm -hmm. 17th century, you, you really couldn't get along without having right. your, furry, your furry friend sure. who would protect you. Sure. I mean, the classic, the whole shepherds with, with dogs that were trained to keep flocks together. And, I mean, that was um, remarkable stuff. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. The dog was, was a, a key dog domestication with a key technology, if you will. You know? you yeah. Know? So you, you could get along today without a dog. It's possible right, a lot of right. people do. <clears throat> and yet I, I think it's worth taking a moment, as we are, to look back and appreciate from whence we came uh, in terms of developing uh, the species on the planet. And if you think about it, the fire was probably critical to helping bring the dog into our orbit, basically, because one can envision wolves hanging out around at the periphery of fires you know, waiting to get extra food, and, and those that sort of behaved well gradually became dogs, and those that didn't slunk off in the woods and stayed as wolves, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And you were telling me about a, an experiment that was going on to domesticate Foxes. wild animal, yeah. wild dogs today to make them into, how did that work? So there, this is, an, actually, it's still ongoing in, in, in Russia, uh, but back in the mid, I think, 60s, it started, this, this one guy took lots of foxes and he started breeding the calmest gentlest foxes together and also breeding the wildest nastiest ones together and because of the way foxes reproduce you can do this once a year and, and you get a new generation and after 15 years 15 generations he had foxes that were changing in their appearance their tails were curling up their coats were changing their faces were shortening a little bit their ears were, were lopping a little bit and they're changing in temperament. They're becoming very nice. They're becoming dog-like, basically, um, after just 15 generations. And now, I think it's gone on for 30, 40, 50 years now. And, and yeah, they've got way more. Um, so they have these these wonderful domestic foxes now, as or uh, that are no longer real foxes. They are basically a sort of second line of domestic dog. Uh, We're married to dogs. Uh -huh. our, our species is married. I mean, give me a family who wouldn't want one. Right. Give me a kid who wouldn't want one. Right, right. You know, not, not everybody has them, but, but it's clear that, um, you know, we, we, are, we are married to them as a species. The other thing is, uh, like, like fire, you don't, you don't see much fire, open flame around these days, except in, in wildfires in, in California. <laughs> but in, in terms of dogs, we do see dogs, uh, mm -hmm. not only in the home, but we... We see them used to sniff out drugs, we see them at the airports. Mm -hmm. We see them on the battlefield, mm -hmm. as we did in World War II. I'm, I'm sure they still right. have these German Shepherd dogs uh, in the battlefields elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they'll probably continue to play a, a role because they are. The remarkable thing about dogs is you can instruct them to do something, and they will do what you want. Right. It, how different is that from a computer? Right, right. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in a sense, right. But, yeah, but they're mobile and they have capabilities that we don't have, right? They have a much better sense of smell, for instance, than we have. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, they can, yeah, yeah. Right. So we, I think we have to be aware of all of these things as we go forward and learn about it's innovation. Some, some of our early technologies are still sort of reverberating with us, right? Right. And, and maybe it drives us to be innovative, to see mm -hmm. how well we've done with these early technologies. Exactly. exactly. We know it at some level in our DNA. And yeah. makes a, it makes us... Uh, hereditarily makes us innovative. We are an innovative species. Right. I'm sure you know, the, the genes for innovation have been passed along and survived. And yeah. Those that didn't have it didn't make it. Yeah. And I feel now, between you and me, that it makes us do this show. <laughs>
Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Jay. Great to talk with you. Take care. Take care. <laughs>